It is uh, great to be with you, and as you're turning in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, we'll be in uh, Luke chapter 19 this morning as we we take a look at uh, some of the accounts of the triumphal entry. And as you're doing that, I want to uh, just celebrate and inform you that uh, our worship director, Cam, uh, got to uh, be with uh, his Uh, very pregnant wife over the course of the weekend. And uh, sure enough, Cecilia delivered their daughter, Rainy Sousa, this morning. And uh, she was eight pounds and seven and a half ounces. And so uh, they have been in that hospital room since about uh, 12 p.m. on, I think, Friday. So they're probably exhausted. <laughs> and so uh, we just are, are, are so happy for them and uh, look forward to meeting her and, and getting to celebrate. And so uh, congratulations, Cam and Cecilia. Um, this uh, passage that we're going to look at this morning uh, it, it is one that is familiar to us. We, we take a look at uh, the events of Palm Sunday pretty much every year. And it's the opportunity for us to, to see this, this moment of Jesus kind of coming into Jerusalem and people are worshiping him and, and laying down their coats and, and palm branches and, and shouting Hosanna. And they're thrilled that, that the, the, the coming king has arrived, riding in on a donkey. And the irony of this passage that we look at every year is that just a, a, a days later, the same citizens of Jerusalem are crowd, shouting, crucify him. And calling for him to be put on the cross over a hardened criminal like Barabbas. And so this morning's text uh, is unique in its account of Jesus coming in for this this triumphal entry, this moment, because it has this this small uh, text in verse 41 of chapter 19 that describes Jesus coming in and and having people shout Hosanna and lay these palm branches down. And as he's coming down Mount Olive and he sees the city and hears the worshipers, he begins to weep. And and this is so poignant for us to to see in, in kind of process in our mind and to see we have this new king that coming into Jerusalem... And people are worshiping him. You think this would be this great triumphal moment, yet Jesus is weeping. And I think there's an opportunity for us this morning to kind of understand this this text as we reflect on our own hearts and minds, as we we enter into uh, this weekly celebration of Holy Week, we get to stop and think about the person of Jesus in our relationship with him. You see, the people of, of, of Jerusalem, they had heard for most of their life about this, this promised Messiah, and they're anticipating him. Israel's ancient prophets promised that God himself would arrive and rescue his people and rule the world one day. And the prophets described a coming king that would ride into Jerusalem and bring justice and peace. This is a people that they're living under occupied Rome. They are experiencing what it's like to have been conquered. We think of our own world events now, and you think of Ukraine being invaded by a foreign people trying to claim control over their land. And this had happened in Jerusalem. They're already conquered. They're already subjugated. And so they're longing for care. And their spiritual leaders and and the Pharisees and the Sadducees had already set this this massive burden of, of spiritual expectations upon the people. And so they were striving for perfection that was fueled by fear rather than living in excellence to serve the Lord that was fueled by God's grace. And so Jesus is activating all the people's hopes that, that he's the king riding on the donkey to bring justice. And however, the leaders of Jerusalem, they were looking for this warrior Messiah to vanquish their political adversaries, the people that they disagreed with or they felt were in opposition to them. And so the triumphal 
entry here displays Jesus coming to this rebellious city. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a hotbed of resistance against Jesus' rightful authority of, as God. And so the irony of the worshipers laying their robes and palm branches down was not lost on Jesus as he rode into the city weeping. You see, the king rode into Jerusalem that day and he was not the king that they had expected. Jesus, he's a new kind of king. He's the king that humanity needed and still needs to this day. So let's read, uh, just for the, the, the sake of context, let's start in chapter 19 and verse 28 and follow along as I read, and we'll read through verse 44. Luke writes, and when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they sat Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the day down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven who comes in the name of or a peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Again, this is the people that are they're, they're at odds with Jesus over his authority. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Verse 41, And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you... Even you had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And let's just take a moment and pray this morning as we reflect on the reading of God's word. Father, we're so thankful for your redeeming work. We're thankful that we are blessed by the depth of your word. Thank you that we live in, in this time, that we get to see your work, that we, we have the benefit of hindsight. Lord, but I pray this morning that you would help our spirits to learn from our predecessors, to learn from those who have come before us, that we would not miss out on the type of king that you are, and that we would be able to see the kingdom that you're building now and for our future. We pray this in your name. Amen. I think that reflecting on Palm Sunday is an opportunity for, to prepare for Jesus' continuing work in our own lives. As we uh, come into Holy Week, I, I, I want you to think through over these next three services today and, and, and Good Friday, and as we, we gather to celebrate Christ's uh, resurrection, to th yes, woohoo, is indeed, is to think through uh, your relationship with God. This is a, a, a great opportunity for us as a people to think about our expectations. And to use one of my favorite words is, is to calibrate our expectations to God's word. You ever have uh, those, those seasons in your life where you have a vision for how you want something to go? Whether it's just as simple as planning out your day or, or maybe it's a, a project for, for how you want something to be built or uh, maybe it's as simple as, as a vacation. You kind of have these expectations for what you want your time off to look like and you, and you kind of have this, this long-awaited anticipation for a, a breather. And we had this recently and, and uh, 
I'm in grad school and, and, and finishing my master's degrees. And so uh, I, I'm in just in, in the thick of it in, in terms of studying and, and normal work and, and raising children and, and making sure that I'm, I'm not uh, neglecting my wife. And so life, life feels full right now. Uh, I, it's in, in all good things. But I was, I was ready for a breather. And so uh, February vacation was coming for the kids' school week. And I had built up in my mind a vision of what I wanted that week to look like. I had the expectations that this was going to accomplish something in and for me that I, I needed. And by God's grace, my expectations were circumvented. And so uh, sometimes we think we know what's best for us. We think we know what we, what, what's going to create uh, the results that we desire uh, and I'm so thankful for, for others. And so we got to go on this, this trip with uh, some friends of ours. And I'll tell you what, uh, they, na- they know how to vacation. And, uh, and by knowing how to vacation is, is, is they don't uh, follow a rigid schedule. And, and I, I like to have a schedule, right? I, I plan out a vision for myself. Laura and I will, will, will have uh, discussions because I, I sometimes have a vision in my head that's not communicated. And so then that creates what? Non-communicated expectations, right? And that is what we call a recipe for marital disaster, okay? So don't, husbands, wives, talk. <laughs> There's nothing better than talking and, 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 and getting on the same page. And so we went on this trip, and, and I just kind of relinquished control and, and kind of let go of my expectations. And the gift that God gave me was that we had these, these wonderful, active moments. And the, the older couple that we were with, they just kind of mentored us in the way of vacationing and said, all right, let's go out, let's do an activity, and let's come back and do nothing. And everybody just go do your own thing. And so I got to sit and like read books like that I wanted to read that weren't for school. Like for me, that is like so life-giving. Had I had followed my schedule, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I, I think expectations uh, play into a lot of our spiritual dissonance. And, and they, they play into sometimes that unrestfulness or sometimes they even create blinders because we're so focused on achieving our created vision that we miss what is going on in the lives of others or even more importantly, we miss what God is doing. Because we're so fixated on what we want or what our vision for our life is that that we don't get the full picture. And that's what's going on here is Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. His disciples who have, have been following him and witnessed Jesus demonstrating his authority that he is doing things that only God could do. He's healing people. He's letting blind people see. He's raising people back from the dead. He's teleporting. He's turning water into wine. He's feeding people with with a few loaves of bread and fish, 5,000 and then 4,000. He's doing things that only God could do. He's healing people when he's not even in the same room. He's, He's miles away and he speaks it and it's done. That is who the disciples are seeing, right? And so they're thrilled, they're excited. They have much reason to rejoice, much reason to lift their voices, to shout Hosanna. Every reason to lay down their robes, to throw palm branches down to make way for the king. The irony is that after witnessing all of these things over the most difficult next week that that is in front of them, most of them are going to disperse. Some of them are going to be shouting, crucify him. And some of them are going to deny him. After witnessing all of these miraculous things, how did we get there? How do they, how do they get to that point? And so I, I think it's important for us to recognize that, that hindsight is powerful. And I think we have to give them a measure of grace because we have the benefit of seeing the whole scope of Scripture. We get to see what happens next in their story. They didn't know. And like them, we don't know what's next in our story. And so the hope that I have for us this morning is that we would be able to see the new kind of king that we have. And that that would lead us to think differently about how we worship and about how we follow Jesus. What do you expect from your king? 
I think a lot of times, our, even our, our own picture of God's victory in our lives or in our society is not really what he's trying to talk about when, in Scripture when he, he refers to his kingdom and the place that he's preparing for us or building for us. A lot of times, we, we love to read our own presuppositions into these texts. We love to, to think about victory, and we associate it with uh, strong self-achievement. Or our self-glorification, or our own significance is read into victory, or yes, I'm on the side of power. And so God's kingdom, we build in our own minds ultimately about ourself, not about God. And so the opportunity here for us as we read through Luke is to not lose sight of the context, to not lose sight of, of what it means to be a worshiper of God. That we wouldn't only worship God if he's going to build the kingdom that we want. Because I think that the the Israelites here in Jerusalem, they wanted him to come in and, and overthrow the city and take control. Jesus, we've seen you have the power. We know you can chuck the Romans out of the city. We're ready for that. Let's do it. Let's get them gone. That way we're in control. That way we're significant again. That's why we can we can be the 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 in charge. And so their expectations for Jesus to come and overthrow with power and and dominion is subverted through how he spends the next week suffering and dying. And that's the power he chooses for us. So let's just take a look again at at this text. And so uh, in verse 41, we see uh, it says, and when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. He wept over it. I liken this to, to the weeping prophet Jeremiah. And we, we spent uh, a couple of years in the book of Jeremiah together. And you could see just the, the, the sadness for the people who were unrepentant. And God just warns them, turn from your sin, turn from your sin. And they wouldn't. And Jeremiah is just sad because he gets to see the picture of the 70 years of suffering that they're going to have to endure. And so I liken that to Jesus is weeping for the city because he's coming in. And he knows that the people, they, they don't get it. And not only don't they get it, but they're going to suffer. They're going to deal with with, with the fallout of their sin. They're going to deal with the fallout of of what's to come in terms of history. And I think it's important, just like Jesus wept for Lazarus, not because uh, Lazarus was dead, but because he had compassion on those who felt the loss of Lazarus. Jesus weeps again because he is a God of compassion. He's a God who empathizes for us in our weakness, who understands our humanity because he experienced it and understands what it feels like to not have the full scope and sequence of what God is doing. And so he wept for the city, and I think in, in many different ways. And I think he ultimately weeps because he's a God that values souls. He's a God who is on earth because he loves his creation. Because he wanted to rescue and redeem us. And so he's weeping coming into the city. And I think we should see the tears of Christ as the measure of the value of our soul. That he values you. <laughs> and that he sees us and understands us. I see uh, Isaiah 53, 4 uh, talks about how he wept for those who, who, who reject him or, or that he feels that he's weeping, I think, because he knows that these people that he's coming in are going to reject him. Isaiah 53, uh, 3 through 4 says he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. He knows that these people are going to reject the very God who came to save them and love them. That that saddens him. I also think he he wept for those who would suffer. If you turn just one page over to Luke 21, chapters 20 through 24, Jesus foretells of Jerusalem's coming destruction. 
He says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that it is desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are inside the city depart and let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and the wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. You see, this is going to happen 37 years later. In 70 AD, the Romans laid siege to Jerusalem and destroyed it, just as Jesus prophesied. And about 1.5 million people were killed. Jesus weeps knowing this is what's in front of these very people that are shouting Hosanna. They didn't get it. They misunderstood. I think he also weeps because of the hardness of heart in Luke 15, earlier in the, in, in the gospel. He says, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. See, Jesus longs for us to have soft hearts. But a lot of times our hearts are hard because we're fixated on the wrong kingdom. We're fixated on building and dwelling in the wrong kingdom. See, God values humble souls. Psalm 51, 16 through 17 says, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. You see, God wants us to be broken. He wants us to be humble. He wants us to acknowledge our need and to submit to his vision for his kingdom. And brothers and sisters, it's a good one. It's a great vision. It's a wonderful, wonderful promise. And so I think as we see this this greater context of scripture in this moment of Jesus weeping, we must acknowledge that we too have rejected him at times. We too reject his word at times. And guess what? We too, if we're gonna follow him, will probably suffer. And he promises that to his disciples. He said, they're gonna, they hate me, therefore they're gonna hate you. He promises hardship. And we also need to weep and acknowledge our own hardness of heart, humble ourselves and be thankful that we have a God who sees all of that, who sees the whole scope and sequence of the city, who gets it fully, understand what is, what has been and what is to come and still loves them, still goes to the cross for them. That is a God of compassion. And so I think it's important that we weep over our sin and rejoice in God's compassion for us. Those things aren't uh, mutually exclusive. I think they both need to be true. I mean, we, we need to acknowledge and recognize the depth and the significance of our sin towards a holy God and rejoice simultaneously that God is compassionate and loving towards us. And let that truth be fuel for our worship. Let that truth be fuel for how we envision a kingdom. How we experience the past that surpasses all understanding. And to get back into the text, he responds uh, to the people as he's weeping and he's coming into the city and he says, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. You see, we miss sometimes what is really going to provide us peace. The things that are going to provide us practical peace, like peace with the Roman conquerors, but also spiritual peace. What are the things that are going to provide you the eternal security, the security that the the, the Israelites in Jerusalem longed for? We want to feel safe. We want to feel free. We want to feel like we're not marginalized. Those are all reasonable things. But the means to achieve that is not what they had thought. You see, they had misguided expectations for a political warrior Messiah that was going to come and conquer everyone who they hated. 
I like how Dr. King, uh, Martin Luther King says this. He says, uh, seek, uh, I'm sorry, hate seeks to annihilate rather than convert. And Jesus converts us not through hate and force, but he converts us through love. And that is the way that he builds his kingdom. And so peace is not obtained by might here in what Jesus does. Spiritual peace is secured through submission, surrender, and suffering. Those are the things that Jesus does. He submits to the Father, obeys the Father, even to the point of death on the cross. He surrenders his will to the Father. Not my will, but yours be done, he will say this upcoming Good Friday. And he suffers. That's how he obtains peace for us. That is the way he chose to build his kingdom. You see, Jesus is the way for peace. Turn briefly with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter two. Hebrews two. I love how the writer of Hebrews uh, shares this. Uh, Speaking of of Jesus' means for our salvation, and we'll start in uh, verse 10. It says, for it was fitting that he for whom by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers saying, I will tell you of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation, I will, pray, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. Behold, I, the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery, For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. See, Jesus is the way for us to experience this peace. He is with us in our suffering. He is with us as we follow and obey and walk into his kingdom building path, not our own. And so what is the obstacle for us to see this kingdom? What is the obstacle for us to really get it? What was the obstacles for the people who were shouting Hosanna and then days later crucified him? I I think it's three things. I think sin blinds us to this way of peace. And and it it manifests, I I think, in a couple different ways. I think the first one is fear. They were afraid, can I trust God? Can I trust his word? Can I trust that he is real, that he is truth? I'm afraid. I'm afraid to to give him control. I'm afraid to obey. I'm afraid to submit because I like my way. I like my vision. God, is is your vision for the kingdom really better than it can be for mine? Because I'm pretty important in my vision. I'm pretty significant in my vision. I'm in control in my vision. I I have have domineering and, and, and I'm successful in mine. And then I had pride. Pride gets in the way. I'm I'm in control. I don't need you. I can do this. I value my autonomy over your position as God. Pride gets in the way from us seeing our need to follow Jesus' way for the kingdom. And then we, we think about how is this victory achieved? I think sometimes we try to have in our own mind the power to achieve victory. I can do this on my own. I have the power. I don't need you, God. The irony is that nobody's been able to achieve that. Everybody who has ever lived will die apart from God's power. And so we convince ourselves in our own life, even in the small day-to-day ways, that our power's enough, I'm in control, And I'm just going to trust myself. 
And so our sin blinds us to the way of peace. I think just like these people of Jerusalem were blinded to the plan that God had. Jesus was so patient and kind. He shares his plan with his disciples. And remember, hindsight is twenty we We're able to look back and say, how did they not get it? Well, I think, we, again, we need to be gracious. But Jesus explains the way to the kingdom. He explains the plan that he's laid out. He tells them what he's going to do. And then he goes and he does it. And it's only until after it happens that they're really like, oh, light bulb. <laughs> That's what Jesus was talking about. I get it now. There's so many things in our lives that play into that. And so don't miss the way to peace. Don't miss what God is doing. Just like he's, he's coming in, riding in this triumphal entry. Hosanna, Hosanna, don't miss what he's doing. Don't miss the greater context of what he's doing in your life and in the span of of eternity. And let's read again the, the, this passage. He says, Would that you, in verse 42, even you had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you. And this is what he's alluding to coming in the destruction of Rome, conquering the city and laying waste to them. And he's, he's sad for this. He's weeping for this. And then he says this, because you did not know the time of your visitation. You didn't know. You ever, you ever had one of those moments with, with, with a friend or a spouse or, or somebody and you did something and, and, and you didn't know <laughs> what was going to happen. You didn't realize that it, it would result in this. And had you had known, you would have done something differently. And you have those conversations to say, I, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know that this was going to play out this way. I, I was unaware. I, I wasn't able to see how this impacted you or, or how this impacted me. Uh, I remember working at uh, the rescue mission that I served at as a chaplain in the city of Scranton, Pennsylvania. And I cannot tell you how many drug addicts would tell me that. I didn't know that it would ruin my life like this. I thought I could just try it and, and, it, and it wouldn't ruin me. I didn't know. Didn't know. You see, I, I think that sometimes we have to Take a step back and acknowledge our own ignorance. We don't know. We don't know everything. We like to think we do, but we don't know. And Jesus says, look, you, you, you didn't know the time. You didn't know that God in the flesh is visiting you. You didn't know the time of your visitation. You didn't know that I was here. If they fully got that, guarantee they would have diff done something differently over the next week. They didn't know. See, his own people rejected him because they failed to recognize his true identity as the embodiment of Israel's God. By rejecting Jesus, they rejected God's visit and they missed God's long-awaited visit, right? The long-awaited Messiah, the one that they're all longing for, and they're like, oh yeah, he just walked through the street. I missed it? That was him? Oh! You see, Jesus is weeping, tears flowing down his face over the consequence of that failure. You miss the time of my visitation. You see, that they were ignorant of the time in which they lived. They didn't get it. They were ignorant of the coming and the means of their redemption. Their redemption had come, and they didn't know that this is how he was going to redeem them. <laughs> was through submission Surrender and suffering. It wasn't through this warrior Messiah to slay everybody. That's later in the book of Revelation, which will be awesome. But for us as a people, let's recognize that we are so much like these people. You see, they were ignorant of their own rebellion towards God's authority. The Pharisees, right? They're sitting there saying, rebuke your disciples, you don't have the authority to have these people worship you. You're not God, right? They, they didn't get it. They missed the point. They were ignorant of their own rebellion. Don't be ignorant 
of your own rebellion. You see, it is so much easier to be angry over other people's sin in the world than your own. Don't be ignorant that you too are in this story, living out the same behavior now. The hope for us is this, that Jesus understands our weakness, that Jesus understands our folly and our ignorance and chooses to love us anyways, chooses to spend the next week going to the cross, being flogged and beaten and mocked and ridiculed, put on an unjust and unfair trial and dies for a people who didn't get it. They had missed it. I like how Paul Tripp says it. He says, our sin is what separates us from God, but it's our self-righteousness that keeps us from running to him for the grace he willingly gives to all who come. What's stopping you from being able to acknowledge all that stuff? To acknowledging your pride, your fear, even acknowledging your lack of power to accomplish your vision for your kingdom? What's holding you back from that? See, God is willingly ready to help us change. What's holding you back from from being renewed and shaped by God? I like how in Philippians uh, chapter two, he's speaking of God's redeeming work and, and he challenges us to have this mind among yourselves. Change your mind. Have this mind that that God is our source of salvation, that God is the, the power unto salvation. How is your mind being changed? Are you having the mind like the Israelites in Jerusalem worshiping, saying, I will worship you as long as it serves my vision. But if it doesn't meet my expectations, I'm out. I think a lot of times that's the Christianity that we like to build. As long as our brand of the gospel serves my vision, I'll align with it. But rarely do we see, I'm going to acknowledge God's authority, submit to that even when it's painful even when it means I have to start by saying I'm wrong, that I know nothing, and that I probably missed a whole bunch of stuff. That's that's the kingdom opportunity that's in front of us. You see, following Christ's example of humility will nurture spiritual self-awareness. Remember, the submission Surrender and the suffering. That's the example of humility. That will nurture our spiritual self-awareness. And this is the remedy to our deeply rooted spiritual ignorance. There are so many blind spots in each of our lives. Whether it's pride, whether it's fear, whether it's our need for power and control. Let us let go of all of those things. Let us be a people that worship, acknowledging the beauty and the glory fully of our God with real awareness of who we are. Because of our new kind of king, we can live a new kind of life. We do not have a king who doesn't know what's going on. We have a king who fully gets it who fully understands you. We have a king who has a plan. Listen, there's a lot of people that are in leadership in different parts of the globe, and they're trying to convince you that they know what they're doing. I will tell you, the more I grow as a leader, the more I have learned that they have no idea what they're doing because I'm a leader, and a lot of times I have no idea what I'm doing. This morning I was on my knees saying, Lord, Lord, help me because I don't know. I, I, am, I am woefully blind to what is going on sometimes. And the more that we can stop and acknowledge that, the better we'll be able to worship. 
the better we'll be able to follow God, the better we'll be able to be changed and transformed by this saving truth that Jesus came for people he cared about, a people that worshiped him one day and crucified him seven days later. That is the God who loves us. And we're gonna celebrate that God over the next week, over the rest of our lives, hopefully here. But specifically, we're gonna think about these moments. We're gonna think about how this shapes and impacts the very tenets and foundation of our faith. And my prayer that as you reflect on your life, as you reflect on even maybe what you're going through now, that you can remember that you have a God who has wept for you. Because he understands your sin, he understands your rebellion, and he understands that you just didn't get it. You didn't quite understand. And he loves you anyways. How great is that God? We're gonna sing in this next moment how great thou art. He is worthy for us to just stop and reflect and say, there's nobody like you, God. There's nobody like you who would come and willfully choose the path that you chose to build a kingdom, a path that is submission, surrender, and suffering. No earthly leader is gonna say, that's the path that I want to build my country. No. That's what God did for us. Let's pray together this morning as we prepare to continue in our worship. Father, thank you. Thank you that you fully understand and you fully know. Jesus, thank you for being obedient. God, you see us just like you see the people of Jerusalem coming down from the mountain. You know our folly. You know our fickle hearts. You know that we're gonna be wooed and, and, and tried to, to be pulled away from you and, and, and all kinds of things in this world. And you still chase after us. You still love us. God, I'm so thankful that you're not done working. That the story's not over. That as we celebrate your resurrection over the next week, that we know that there's more to come. I pray that that hope, that that vision for the kingdom that you have given us in your word would be the very thing that shapes how we live now, how we invest our lives now. May they be built around you and your vision, not ours. Help us, Lord, to submit to you. Help us to surrender to you. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to endure suffering because it's the way in which you shape us and grow us. And may we count it all joy. We pray this in your name. Amen.